It is now my honor to formally introduce my co-chair, Dr. Rodney Samako. Dr. Samako is the assistant professor and investigator at the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine. His research program focuses on optimizing the framework for preclinical readiness of rare disease models. His team evaluates the natural history of disease in genetically modified rodents to identify measures that may serve as surrogate endpoints. By fostering collaborations across the landscape of patient advocacy, academic, and industry groups, he strives to advance community-based participatory approaches in research and development of actionable therapies for rares. Dr. Samako is moderating our first segment, The Building Blocks of Disease Understanding and Preclinical Research. Rodney, it's all yours. Thank you, Kari, for that wonderful introduction and very kind of you um, to speak of me in that way. <laughs> so I'm Rodney Samako. I will be moderating the first part of this session on a lot of the preclinical questions that um, we're engaged with as, as a community when we speak with our various stakeholder groups, whether they be researchers, patient advocates, et cetera. Um, there are a lot of, I would say, questions that have emerged, especially in the context of advanced therapeutic modalities and, develop and development of them. So I would say that um, let's start first, though, with the journey of an individual, Donna Pell, who I will let her introduce herself um, prior to moving into this session, because Donna has a very interesting story and she could share with you her lived experience and her challenges and successes in building a foundation. Hi, my name is Donna Appel, and I am so grateful to be presenting uh, here today. I know that you can all kind of relate to this story, um, but I'm kind of here to set the stage. I represent hermansky pudlock syndrome, and it's an autosomal recessive single gene disorder. Presently, we have 11 different gene types. It's characterized by albinism, legal blindness. There's a bleeding disorder um, with all gene types caused by a platelet dysfunction. In about 20% of our folks, they develop a Crohn's-like colitis. More seriously, 100% of the time in HPS 1, 2, and 4, they develop a fatal pulmonary fibrosis. And without a lung transplant, they succumb in their early adult years. My daughter was born with albinism, with what we thought was albinism. And then she hemorrhaged to shock in her crib at two years old from the bowel disease. She bled so badly, she needed 36 units of platelets, six units of blood. She sustained a traumatic brain injury. And if we had known more about HPS, that would have never happened. After three months of hospitalization, I knew I had to find the experts. I loved her so much. I had to find the research. I had to find the cure. I found nothing. I started the HPS network and began this crazy journey of trying to cure disease and find research. It was beyond daunting. We came to find out that Ashley had the fatal type of HPS and now we're racing a clock. So besides working full time, being the caregiver to my daughter, the mom, to my son, the wife, I now had to learn research, genetics, pharmacology, and politics. And mostly I had to figure out how to go about marketing a disease, especially one with such a stupid name. My organization challenges didn't help when I established it. Our people are visually impaired. We have a founder's effect in Puerto Rico. So many of our families are Spanish speaking. We do a lot of work on the island of Puerto Rico and connectivity can really be a big barrier to engagement. I send out great information and education, but if people can't connect, that's a bigger issue. And that island, they have hurricanes and earthquakes, sandstorms, and things become insurmountable at times. Our biggest hurdle, of course, is our tiny budget, just like everyone else feels. So where do I begin? Like, how do I go? What direction do I go in? So first you gotta learn, like Kari was saying, you just have to learn and keep your eyes open. 
Now, I remember in the very beginning calling for help. I actually called the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and they were so kind to me because they were the first people that taught me the difference between bench research and clinical research. Picking up the phone makes such a difference. Not knowing where the, how do I know where the cure is going to come from? So I just started looking at the two types of researches and, and made a list. And I grant, began growing them simultaneously. I wanted to investigate stem cells and organoids and gene therapies and things that we're going to learn in this panel discussion this morning. But I made a list. It was my to-do list to find bench researchers. And then I wanted to make clinical experts as well. So it was like growing our research one seed at a time. I just kind of worked it out and thought of the acronym DOC. I wanted to look for DOCs. So it became discovery, opportunities, and commitment. The first thing I needed to do was discover what's out there. I needed to expose the, co cure, the cause and do outreach. And then making those contacts with umbrella organizations like our hosts, the Global Genes and the Orphan Disease Center. These people are amazing. And finding my metabolic pathway partners, who's next to us in that gene? That I set our Google alerts and our journal alerts so that every morning I would get an influx of things in my inbox and then I would read them and call those authors. Also finding out where the researchers live. I would look, we needed pulmonary research. So we, I worked very closely with the American Thoracic Society. We have a booth at their conference and I'm on the public advisory round table and have been on their board of directors. I even just cold call researchers. My biggest victory was a cold call to the NIH. And believe it or not, I got Dr. William Gall. And to decide about taking on HPS two decades ago, he asked us to collect 24 hour urine buckets from any families we knew with HPS. We had to do this in the winter because they had to be refrigerated. So we put them on our deck in the snow to keep them cold. It was life-changing for our organization and the beginning of our clinical research journey. We also took lots of road trips. My kids always thought that they were going on summer vacations in cool places like Niagara Falls, but it was really Roswell Park Cancer Institute to meet the, the PhDs that had the mice labs. We went to Maine and it was Jackson Labs. It was a great discovery for the kids, but it was really just moving science. After we discovered who's out there, we knew that I needed to provide opportunities. So we host a science meeting called the Meeting of the Minds. It started with four or five researchers, and now we're up to 50. Annually, they get together and talk in a space that's very collegial, but they can only present their work if it's unpublished data. Each year, I invite a guest speaker to come. We think of a subject matter like that we want to learn about, like an organoid, for instance, and we look around the country and try to invite best in class to come to the conference and be our rock star. They don't have to know anything about HPS, but the trick is I ask them to go last in the speaking agenda so that they listen to all the researchers that discuss HPS, and maybe by the end of the day, they apply some of it to their particular subject matter. And of course, involving always young investigators with poster sessions and the like. We combine all of that with our family conference because we want our researchers engaged with our people. We actually do an English version and then a Spanish version separately rather than a translated conference, we do them separate. We really want to ask our researchers to meet our family so we always break bread, bread together. I guess, sadly, um, it's what I got, but I'm not ashamed of our small budget. We've supplied mouse food and we've covered annual bills for electro electron microscopy uh, repairs. We've given office equipment and, and now we're grown to provide salary for postdoc. We also are creating experts by providing CME classes. We help with clinical trials. We're recruiting for our symptom scale study. And we really try to bring our researchers along uh, by, by giving them our biospecimens. It's our culture. We have a program called We're Drawn Together. So we invite our researchers to bring the science to us rather than us going to the science. They run IRB approved clinical projects. One year we had five of these going on at the same time. 
We had to have space for obtaining consents, which all had to be in Spanish and large print. And we had stations with my friends as phlebotomists, and we ended up drawing 98 specimens of blood and four stool specimens, and we accomplished it all in an hour and 55 minutes. So after providing these opportunities, now we want commitment. We need this research to be committed to our cause. Um, so you can, we continually have ruthless groveling. And here's a picture of my daughter like uh, that we sent to our researcher who's studying the CRISPR-Cas9 research. Um, but we want to help them grow their peer group in our research. And we want to show our commitment by showing our, the growth of our cohort. We want to be able to establish a research-ready organization. So our job is to prepare our patients and our families. So we created the individual research plans. We identify the barriers for each and every member of our organization and figure out what those barriers are. If it's fear, we find them a buddy. If it's money and they can't afford a day off from work, we provide them support. If it's transportation, we get them to research. So we try to look at the barriers and, and try to mitigate it. Um, we also make sure we have open communication with our researchers and actually help them communicate with each other. So we're creating a forum. And for our new investigators, we're always sure to tell them that we're there to help. We could provide speakers or send pictures or slides. We could write letters for supports of their grant. We make sure they know that we are willing to help. In summary, I just kind of think if you got to find your docs, I think of DOC, um, discover who they are, um, offer opportunities and inspire their commitments. I know it sounds kind of like um, a little Pollyanna-ish, but you know, we, we got to start by just beginning. And this is uh, pretty much uh, gets built over time. Uh, and I am really excited to hand this panel back to our amazing scientists that are going to actually, uh, I'm going to learn a lot actually, and I'm so glad to be here. I want to thank you so much for listening. I want to thank our organizers and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Donna, for that wonderful background and this just the entire story. It's just amazing. And I think a lot of those um, vignettes that you shared with us today will be very helpful and encouraging for people who are part of the conversation. So now I would like to move forward with um, our scientists who are going to provide some of that background knowledge and domain expertise um, in terms of understanding the landscape. The landscape, the lexicon, um, having the literacy to understand some of these basic blocks of disease understanding and basic research. Sometimes when people are talking about CRISPR or organoids or mouse model, conditional knock-in, knock-out, et cetera, could be very confusing. Um, and on, in addition, once you understand what those topics might mean um, to you or your, I would say, group, um, perhaps it's not entirely clear which path you should pursue. So today, um, we have three individuals who will speak about the building blocks, preclinical development pathways and inflection points, and the business of what we like to call the process. Um, and we have James Doyle from Modellus. Um, Ralph Schmidt from the Perelman School of Medicine, GTP program, University of Pennsylvania, and Yale Weiss from Ultragenics. And so we'll start with this topic. What is the intent? What is your motivation? James, please. Thanks, Rodney, for the, the in introduction. So um, everybody, it's it's great to be here. It's it's always fun being part of the Global Genes uh, and this rare disease com com community, which is very uh, open to collaboration. It's something which I really love about this about this this field, and which is very different from the rest of of most other scientific fields or disease areas. So it's really a pleasure being part of this. Um, so, I'll, I mean, it's going to be great kicking this off um, with some of the research tools which are available to you. Um, so a little bit of on, on my background very, very quickly. So I am a scientist by training. I have a PhD in experimental medicine with a focus in molecular genetics. Um, and I took a non-traditional route uh, going the biotech and entrepreneurial route and founding Modellus. Um, back in uh, 2018. So to kick this off, um, we'll discuss, we'll begin discussing some of these, uh, some of these cell-based models or these in vitro models. 
um, which are available for a variety of research uses. And we'll use this time to go through some of these models quickly and go uh, a bit deeper into them later on in the discussion. So among these cell-based models, um, the first ones that we'll touch on are cell lines. So these can be obtained from human or animal tissues, such as fibroblasts that are usually obtained from through a skin punch. Uh, then we have iPSCs <clears throat> that are stem cells uh, that can be differentiated or turned into basically any cell or tissue type. And these can be made, uh, these can be generated from skin or blood cells and are patient specific. Um, but in the absence of any patient specific lines, we do have these CRISPR edited cell lines, which are available. And these are you know, using CRISPR or genetic engineering techniques to mimic very specific patient mutations or very specific genetic variants in the cells where you don't have any patient specific cell lines available. Thank you. Um, so while those, while the models on the previous slide are what we call uh, two-dimensional models, there have been recent advancements in the generation of what we call organoids, which are these tiny three-dimensional structures that can be grown using iPSCs or the induced pluripotent stem cells uh, to study specific tissues or organs in a disease state. And these can be made into brains, livers, pancreas, even muscle cells. And so while in vitro uh, means in the glass and typically refers to cells in a dish, in vivo here um, means in living and refers to simply animal studies or more generally studies in live multicellular organisms. This is really a topic which, which I'm very passionate about uh, since I use these uh, very regularly. Uh, we at Modellus use these for, for, for drug discovery. And so while mice are typically the most common, most well-known of these animals, there are many others that can be used to answer a wide variety of research questions from the very small model organisms, such as fish, zebrafish, frogs, or xenopus, um, flies like Drosophila and worms, C. elegans, uh, and it goes all the way to the larger mammals like pigs, dogs, and other non-human primates. And each of these organisms have their own strengths and limitations. And while each can be used to answer specific questions, having multiple ones in your tool belt can really help you answer the widest range of research problems. And as for the types of therapies that are typically available to you, um, the most traditional ones are these, or we'll, go, we'll quickly go over these traditional categories, um, traditional modalities, which are small molecules. So think of your typical pills like, like Advil, uh, which are, can be taken, often can be taken orally. Then we have biologics or protein-based therapies which are usually engineered full length uh, proteins such as antibodies or enzyme replacement therapies, uh, all the way to peptides that are short proteins like insulin, which is probably the most common of these or the most well-known of these. And while we did name these traditional therapies, it's not because they're out of date, it's just because they have a very long and historical use as uh, therapeutic classes. And finally, um, one more approach, which we'll just quickly touch on, um, or yeah, one more approach to, uh, one more tool in your tool belt, which can be used, which is leveraging computational approaches to identify or repurpose drugs. And so aside from all the biological, so the in vitro and the in vivo approaches, there's another aspect which we just quickly want to touch on, which are these computational based approaches, also known as in silico, uh, in silico tools. And these can be, these are most often AI driven, that look to predict molecules by leveraging data, such as molecular targets, to design very effective and for very specific drugs uh, to very specific target proteins. And that can be incorporated or aligned with any of the other strategies we had discussed before, any of the other tools we had discussed before. And also kind of going back to, to an, an important point, each of these can help you answer specific questions. And, and one of these is usually not the be all end all and the broadest range of tools in your toolkit can really help you answer the, the widest range of questions. Hello, um, my name is uh, Ralph Schmidt. I'm a researcher at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I work here at the gene therapy program and my group is primarily interested in uh, rare neurological diseases. Um, in the following slides, I will give you uh, a, a, a few talking points on uh, gene therapy and, and viral-based uh, approaches, um, which is directly complementing what you, what you just heard about uh, using small molecules to try to cure diseases. 
So why are we interested in anything with the word gene in it? Well, one of the reason is that uh, the vast majority of rare diseases, about 80% are genetic in origin. So we really have an opportunity here uh, once the, the, the genetic defect has identified, um, trying, to, trying to directly um, alter the genetic disposition uh, of, of the patient, um, where small molecules typically um, just trying to, trying to uh, alleviate symptoms and, and kind of curing around, around the genetic defect. So how, how do genes work? And I just want to take a step back that you all, all understand the process. Normally we start uh, with the gene is encoded by DNA. Um, that, oops, sorry, that gives uh, uh, a rise to an intermediate form, which we call RNA. And then eventually they end up with a protein. The protein travels to where it has to be in the cell and fulfills its function. So now if there's a mutation uh, in, in DNA, a pathogenic mutation, that precludes the DNA from turned into RNA and then there's also no protein or the protein is so short-lived that there's essentially none there. And, and that is true for, for, a lot of the, uh, for a lot of the genetically encoded, encoded diseases. So now the opportunity then basically is um, to try to repair uh, this right on, 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 on the genetic level. So the one thing what you can do is gene therapy. So you basically add the gene, you add an additional gene, the same gene which is already there with the mutation, but you just add the fully functional one, you add DNA for that. Or you use uh, something which is called gene editing or, or CRISPR, as you heard before, uh, which are tools to basically revert this mutation and turn the mutation into the normal genetic code. Uh, both methodologies then basically would allow to, to produce RNA, then you get protein, and so then uh, the cell can, can resume, resume its normal function. So now uh, gene therapy and gene editing, um, both methodologies consist of um, really two components. So the one thing is our delivery vehicle, um, and that could be uh, something we see all the time, which is, has been established in, in research already, uh, they, they like the FedEx vehicles or planes, you know, all about. But then this could be also something which is emerging or new. Uh, the FedEx analogy would be a drone or, or a robot. And so this one, and I will expand on that a little bit more. And the following slide, uh, the delivery vehicle is uh, typically virally derived or it is, it is some chemical mechanism how to get this piece of DNA or the, the, the gene editing machinery actually into the organism. And then the other imp important component, of course, is the payload. And so the payload now, that it, those are the packages being transported by the, by the by FedEx trucks. They can be of various shapes and sizes. So what that allows to do is really you can do a direct modification, a gene replacement. So one of those boxes would have the gene in, gets put in the body and it ends up in every single cell and is starting to make the protein in which it's lost. The indirect approach would be that this package includes um, instructions uh, how to regulate gene activation. So that could help to either switching the gene on, if that is helpful for the disease. If, uh, for example, in uh, some diseases, you still have a normal copy of the, C, of, the, of the gene left, so you could switch that on to overcome the disease symptoms. Or in other cases, there might be that there is a mutant expressing, and by simply getting rid of that mutant, uh, mutant gene, mutant protein, uh, you, can, you can improve this, the disease symptoms. And you can deliver those uh, regulators and their highly specific regulators. You can just target, target the gene of interest. And then the other indirect method, of course, would be the, the editing. Uh, you can edit on both levels. You can either edit the DNA itself, that's the human genetic code that's kind of a one-time and done thing, so that's a permanent change to the human genome. Or you can edit the RNA that's this intermediate before the protein is made, that is, that is not permanent. So you're not touching the genetic code, you're just basically repairing what comes out of, out of the genetic code. So why is anything with gene therapy, gene editing, really, why, why might that be game-changing? Why there is so, so much buzz about it? 
Well, what, what we think uh, that those technologies can really provide uh, a, a single and durable administration, one-time, one-time administration. And I think one of a good example is, is SMA gene therapy. So again, SMAR, which was um, uh, approved uh, a few years ago. So right now, uh, some of those patients are in, in six years post gene therapy. So they were giving uh, they were giving gene therapy to um, to repair the genetic defect, uh, and then the condition kept improving, and the children are still uh, are still very mobile and have overcome a lot of the, the disease sy symptoms six years after a one time a one time treatment. Of course, time will tell um, how long really this single durable administration will hold, if it's really decades or if, let's say, after 10, 20 years, you need to do some, some kind of re-administration. Re so now um, let's talk about the different modalities, uh, how you can actually administer your gene therapy or gene editing. Um, the one option is viral gene therapy. So what you typically would be using is just the shells of a virus. Um, also for capsids, and I have uh, a picture, you can view the animated picture on the left side here, um, uh, which can provide really efficient delivery. And I, I know looking at that, you probably say, oh, well, this just looks like COVID, um, which is true because it is a virus, but in, in this case, we would only use the outside, not any of the, of the payload, which is inside that virus, because given for COVID, for example, it is really what's inside that virus uh, what, what makes people sick, people sick. So the technology is throw all of this, this away and basically we just rely on, uh, rely on delivery of the ego, which is the outside. Um, so for human therapeutics, um, you mostly rely on lentivirus or adeno-associated uh, you know, virus or AAV. Um, lentivirus, um, it integrates permanently in the genome. Uh, so it just, uh, it just adds itself basically to the human genetic code. So it's really used a lot for ex vivo manipulations where you would take patient cells out, you modify them, and then you can do a lot of quality control steps before you re-implant implant into humans to make sure uh, that everything is okay since it's, it's, it's a permanent integration. AV in, uh, and on the, other, on the other side is uh, the AV genome, the payload, um, persists separately from the human genome and the cell. So you're basically just adding, adding an additional piece of, of DNA, which is also functional uh, inside the cell. And that's why this is really the workhorse now for, for in vivo prep applications where you would directly uh, inject the AV loaded with, uh, with a gene therapy or with the gene editing tools into the patient. Um, another modality is, is adenovirus. Um, you might heard about that. Uh, that's the basis really for the for the JNJ vaccine uh, delivering COVID, COVID uh, spike genes. Uh, it is very immunogenic, so that's why it's really good if you want to um, if you want to cause an immune response and train the immune system. But it is it is less uh, it is less optimal if you want to if you want to cure disease uh, which has nothing to do with the immune system. Um, the non-viral or chemical gene therapies uh, which can be used, uh, those are uh, for the most part liquid, liquid nanoparticles or LNPs. That is really an emerging technology, but I think it really leapfrogged into the public view and we learned a lot about it because that is the basis of the Pfizer and Moderna um, COVID vaccines. And so LNPs are basically another way to deliver genetic information, either DNA or RNA, uh, to, 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 the pa to the patient. Um, then the question is, of course, well, replace a broken gene via gene therapy or just fix it via gene editing. And that really depends, depends on, the, on, the, on, on the context. Um, what you need to achieve, if you really need to replace something, if you need to up down regulate your gene, um, so what your target organs are, if you have one target organ, if you have multiple target organs, um, your patient population, if there's one prevalent mutation uh, and basically targeting that, uh, you, would, you, would allow, you would help to cure a large uh, set of patients, or if it's really uh, a, a lot of different mutations, and so rather replacing the gene. And of course, I mean, it also, it's what is the safer way, what is the safer way in, in the end 
uh, to, to overcome a genetic disease. So real quick, uh, some routes of administration. So you can either uh, apply um, AV technology intravenously, just injecting the bloodstream. You can directly inject it uh, for CNS. It would be in the brain for the most part, or the other organs are, are easier reachable for IV. Or you can go for CNS indications, you can go through the CSF, uh, the cerebral spinal fluid, which is either uh, intrathecally, where uh, it's administered by a needle in the spinal canal, or uh, by injection directly in what's called the Sistema Magna, um, which is closer, closer to the brain as a fluid cavity. Um, those three modalities on the right are really the, uh, the, 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 the good choices right now for any CNS indications, because unfortunately, with IV, you can reach about any organ except for the brain because there's something called the blood-brain barrier, uh, which really precludes anything from seeping out of the blood and entering the brain tissue in an efficient way. Um, so people have been trying to address this uh, for, for a while now, uh, trying to find uh, AV, specialized engineered AV, which could do, do just that because AVs are normally kept uh, hindered by the blood brain barrier to cross over. Um, it has worked really well in mice. So if you inject mice with green fluorescence protein DNA um, encapsulated in AV, the brain lights up vaguely. Unfortunately, um, researchers still working on translating this, this kind of spectacular approach um, in, in, into that it works, that it works also, also in, in primates. Um, so that's why really, I mean, delivering to the, to the spinal cord into the CSF, it's very efficient. Uh, neuromuscular disorders uh, can be addressed that way. Uh, direct injections into the brain uh, or any other nerve tissue, um, really you have, it has to be a, a specific cell population. It's highly local, for example, like for Parkinson's disease, global brain delivery, uh, global brain delivery of, of AV uh, gene therapy to the brain is at the current point somewhat inefficient. It works really best if you have something which is called a bystander, a bystander effect, where the, the cells which receive, your, uh, which receive your gene therapy then uh, can secrete the protein after it's made and so uh, repairing, repairing all the surrounding cells cells as well. But that's obviously a highly specialized situation where, where you're dealing with, uh, with secreted proteins. Um, so this was uh, my part uh, talking about AV uh, uh, gene therapy for the most part. And now I'd like to uh, turn it back to Rodney for the next section. Thank you, Ralph. So um, next, um, we have Yale Weiss, who will talk about the business of science for this matter and why. Yale. Thank you, Rodney, and thank you for Global Genes for putting this workshop together. I hope that this presentation, this whole, whole workshop will be helpful for um, foundations that are starting out and really have, uh, you know, have to make a lot of decisions on which paths to take and also foundations that are already underway and have some idea, but maybe we will be opening other horizons for them or uh, enabling some decision making as well. Um, I won't spend too much time on the business of science. Uh, you know, this is what I do on a daily basis. I'm part of the business development team at Ultragenics, which is a company focused on rare genetic diseases. Uh, I just wanted to um, focus on two topics that come up a lot when we speak with patients and foundations. And uh, the first, which is actually really important is how should you be providing funding to an academic? Should it be a grant or a sponsored research agreement? And did you even know that there's a difference between the two of them? The grant mechanism is usually very simple. It takes less time, which is always more attractive. It's usually cheaper because you don't have to pay for a lot of the overhead costs that universities usually charge when we put in place a sponsored research agreement. However, um, it comes with less strings attached, which is sometimes advantageous, but many times not, because you don't have any rights to anything that's generated out of the research that was funded. 
And in some cases, you may not want it or not need it, but you need to be aware of the fact that if any inventions come out of the work that you funded or any important information is generated, you don't necessarily have rights to it and you can't really do much with it. So in some, and again, in some cases, it's, it's not an issue at all. You're just happy to get someone working on your disease and understanding the biology better and maybe publish so that it's available to others. But in cases where there is a therapeutic option and you want to control the fate of this therapeutic, you may want to look at the sponsored research agreement route. It's more expensive, as I said, you're paying for, um, for more infrastructure in the university, um, but you can get rights to any patent or intellectual property that was derived from the research and access to the data. So it takes longer, it's more expensive, but you get a lot more in return. So definitely when you are starting discussions with an academic, make sure that you understand what the end result of this research would be and what you would like to do with it when it ends. So that's just something that we've heard over and over from foundations that provided grants and then did not have any rights to the data and the positions either license the IP to somebody or the clinician, the academics license the IP to someone who didn't advance the science and, um, and just lost the rights to, the, the foundations lost the rights to it. And then two words on whether patents are important. Um, so if you want to work with a company, yes, a patent is important and highly recommended that the academic or the foundation, if the invention comes from the foundation, that, that you file a patent. Costs money, I know, costs money to maintain it, but highly worthwhile because it gives you a, a strong position when you're talking to pharma, biotech, or other partners that might want to continue development of your inventions and take them into the clinic. There is a, a regulatory pathway called orphan exclusivity that sometimes can bypass the patent uh, because the, regula the regulators will give you uh, this exclusivity in the marketplace based on the fact that you are there first with an invention that no one came up with before. But the combination of having a patent and orphan exclusivity is usually the strongest for, um, for any company that wants to market a drug for a specific indication. So just the highlights and obviously the discussions are much longer. Um, I, I actually really like um, the definition of building a toolbox uh, as a foundation when you're starting out. Um, we see a lot of foundations that have uh, uh, that come to us and they have the toolbox on the left-hand side. They collected things from all over the place, not in an orderly manner and don't really know what's in their toolbox. On, on the other hand, the, the right-hand side is a very nice and orderly tool, toolbox. I don't have that one personally, but I'm sure people do. And it, uh, it allows you to build uh, your toolbox more systematically. If we can go to the next slide, Rodney. Um, so what is a systematic approach to, to, to creating this toolbox or inventory list of what's inside your toolbox? So when you're starting out as a foundation, first of all, you need to understand what's already available. I mean, are there cells? Are there mice? Are there organoids? What is what is already what has already been done, and where has it been done? And do you have access to it? Now, once you have that list, you start identifying the gaps in it. So, if there are cells, but there isn't an animal model, then this is something you probably would like to focus on. If there is an animal model, but it doesn't necessarily um, it's, it's not the best animal model for a gene therapy, then maybe you want to consult with Ralph or somebody who um, was a gene therapy expert on maybe you need a different mouse. Uh, who will make it? Will it be an academic lab? Um, advantages, disadvantages of working with academia versus a company, price, timeline, um, publications, et cetera. What would be the price? How long will it take? How do you, and as I alluded to previously, how much control do you have over the process, oversight, um, milestones, payments, et cetera, um, and, and who owns the results at the end? So 
So I, I don't know. I don't know that we need to go through all the lists here and every point uh, for each tool that my colleagues and my panel pa fellow panelists presented previously. There's there's a um, obviously a, a decision uh, to to be made whether it's needed, whether it's relevant, um, and uh, how much to invest in it. Obviously, if you're just starting out and you're not a very wealthy foundation, you need to focus your efforts and decide what the most important things are that you need to start your journey and get research going and get people interested. If you have abundance of resources, you will probably try to do more. Uh, but there are things that take longer. Mice take longer than, than cells. Um, a natural history study takes longer than a registry. So you also need to put things on a timeline and understand where you are now uh, and where you want to be in a year or two or three, and then start things that take longer, right? When you're kicking off things versus waiting, and then it's, it's take, it will take a lot longer to get the information of the day that you need. Um, we always recommend to, to make cells. We always recommend to have an animal model, but again, it's a matter of resources and timing. Um, you go to Rodney and you ask him, which animal model should I make? Or what's the best animal model for my disease, my gene? Do I need more than one model? Uh, do I need a knockout or an inducible model? And, and, and you know, Rodney will explain to you exactly what each is. Um, does the model have to be 100% identical to what the clinical presentation is? Is it even possible? And what happens if it's not possible? Uh, and then biomarkers are important, especially starting preparing your biomarkers towards clinical development. In diseases that the endpoints take very long, a long time to follow, uh, a neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disease, for example, or a fibrotic liver disease, you want to see if the drug is working sooner, better than later. You can't wait years and years to see a difference. So you want to be able to follow uh, specific uh, biomarkers, whether they're blood biomarkers or an imaging biomarker or an EG biomarker, depending on your disease. Uh, you want to be able to establish this as a good biomarker for your disease so that it could be added into the clinical trials. And this will be done way before you go into the clinic. And, and another thing that we recommend, and I think this is maybe the, the strength of the foundations and the communities, is really know your community and know what a company like Ultragenics or any other company needs to, to know about your community in order to develop, help you develop a therapy. How many patients have been identified? What are the sexes, the age distribution at diagnosis? How many different mutations are represented? Is it, uh, as, as Ralph said, you know, if it's only one very prevalent mutation in most of the community, then there might be a gene editing approach. But if each patient has their own unique mutation that all leads to the same clinical presentation, then the therapeutic approach will be different. Uh, what are the most common cl clinical symptoms? And, and as a company, at least at Ultragenics, when we start thinking about running a clinical trial, the first thing that we will do is survey the community and try to understand what each family and each uh, patient actually feel are the most important things that they would like to see corrected or changed in their disease so that there is a correlation between what we think is measurable to what you think is significant. Um, develop a registry if possible, uh, and this is usually easier and there are many companies these days that can help you develop registries. And um, more complicated and more time consuming and more resource consuming is the natural history study. And the difference between them is the registry usually captures only single time points while a natural history study looks at a disease over time. And the reason that we as a company and other companies as well prefer a natural history study is that in many cases, we can actually use the natural history study as a comparator group in the clinical study and this saves, uh, saves time, saves resources, and also allows um, to, to run a smaller trial with less patients, which will be faster.
I do have one question, and I think it is um, to prompt or at least prime the discussion for additional Q and A um, questions from the audience. But I would say, if I was sitting here um, and I was a father of a child, for example, with a rare genetic disorder, just finished the diagnostic odyssey, and now this is like blowing me away, right? Where do I even begin? I understand biology, let's just say, I understand that. Um, I did study molecular and human genetics, so that's a plus there. But let me ask, how do I begin a foundation when it's just me alone? Let me ask the question of when I see fish, zebrafish, for example, flies, worms, mice, non-human primates, where do I start? Let's say if I had unlimited resources and wealth, great, but I don't. Um, so how do I even fundraise? How do I make actionable what I have tangible in front of me um, with known quantities? So let's start there. Um, and I will either call on you or you could start off whoever's the most eager and enthusiastic. Okay. Um, Yael, since you just spoke, <laughs> let me start with you and we'll work backwards here. Well, I don't know that I can answer all, all your questions. <laughs> and, well, and then, exactly. Uh, and that, that is, that I think that's really valuable, right? In terms of we cannot as a community be something for everybody, but as a network, we can meet those needs, right? I think that is probably the number one the solution and Donna, I, I, maybe you can I, to that. I think that going to Kari and Donna is a really good place to start because they've gone through it. They've, you know, they have a lot of experience on starting from the bottom and going up and, and expanding their networks, expanding their knowledge. And uh, while not one size fits all, right, it's so different for different types of diseases, different genes, different mutations. The process at the end of the day is very similar because you need to have a critical mass of patients that you could collect evidence from. You need to have a community that you could collect information from, and you need to build a scientific network of basic researchers and, and clinicians who understand the disease and want to work on it. And I think Donna's story exemplified it perfectly. The path that she went through is probably the path that almost everyone will go through. I don't think there's any fast forward button here, unfortunately. And I think it's unfortunate that you have to do all of it at the same time. And, and one of the things, so I love Yale's um, discussion. I mean, I wanted, I want to capture, I can't wait to look at it again and write down every single thing that you said to do. So we're blessed that um, right now, if, if Rodney, God forbid, and that it would never happen, that you would need to start a disease group for something. Um, we have certain lists now. There's, you know, the, don't you can't don't reinvent the wheel. You need to grab another group that's a, a bit ahead of you. My organization is super rare, super small, small budget. And Kari at the TSC Alliance, they're my best friends. Like I ask these uh, organizations for help. Um, but you kind of be, have to be able to do many things at one time. Building this road road you know, this road. Um, but I think the biggest thing is to understand who we are. We need to uh, own who we are. And every organization's got something different. So sometimes there's a, you might be, you know, a, a parent that happens to be a researcher. So you're going to go that this as a, as a big science thing. Um, you might be, you know, I, I'm, I'm a mother and a nurse. I'm a little more nurturing for my people. So every organization is going to have its different um, flavor, but you need to begin knowing that what our job is in this is that we are not the scientists. We're not the pharmaceutical company. We're probably not going to find the compound or do the gene therapy. But what our job is, is to collect a really clear defined cohort of people so that we can feed you guys everything you need. And that's our job. And I do wanna say that the people like you, Donna and Kari, you already took an extra step that a lot of patients or 
parents in your community didn't. So you are one step ahead of your whole community, which is not an easy task, right? You're taking a community on your shoulders, but you also, because you did it, you have the ability, the personality and the strength to do it. So you have to be very aware of the fact that you are the one that is going to be able to execute this. Thank you. That becomes a little frightening too, as well. It's like, I can barely raise my children and be the caregiver and then run the organization. And I think the point of having to know all of this, you guys can only imagine how overwhelming it is for our, you know, for families to take on science. And, but you're so wonderful in helping us adjust a, a discussion and course like this, where we get a list do this, do this, do this. It's like uh, opening up a cookbook and looking at a menu. Um, it's wonderful to be able to have those resources and just follow it. Don't reinvent the wheel, just follow along. And it's okay if you miss an ingredient and it's okay if the food is burnt sometimes, it's okay. I mean, just continue and try the recipe and it will work out fine. You have to say that during lunch, I love it. So um, if, uh, we're going to uh, address some of the questions that were in the Q&A as we only have 10 minutes, but if we don't get through all the questions, please join us audience um, in the breakout rooms later today. So uh, a question, a uh, basic science question, um, and anyone can take this, is there any limitation with respect to frame shift mutations? And I think the question here was um, in regards to the therapeutic modality whether it be gene therapy, ASO, or drug repurposing? Uh, I, I can speak to that. So it, it, it really depends on what, what the effect of your frame shift is. So if the frame shift is stop, no RNA, no protein, uh, then it's clearly cut. So you can either replace your do gene therapy, just replace, or you, a frame shift mutation is in most cases, it's probably a single nucleotide. You can just try to repair that. Um, if you, however, if you get stuck with a truncated protein or with something else, um, it, might, it might be more, more complicated. And you actually have to study, uh, you know, sometimes there might be problems if you have a truncated residual protein, you're putting the wild type gene back, you get the functional protein, how they would interact with each other. So that's really on a case-by-case -case basis. You would, you would have to look uh, what the biology is. Okay, um, there's an upvote on a question here, and this is related to sponsored research agreements. Aside from financial benefit, are there any reasons to opt for a sponsored research agreement? For example, what additional control do we get over the future of research and therapeutics? So when you put in place a sponsored research agreement, you can actually put in an option to license the, any intellectual property that comes out of the sponsored research, which in a grant you do not have access to. And you can also put in clauses that um, give you rights to information, um, looking at publications before they're published, um, having milestones that the academics need to meet. And if they don't meet them, you can stop theoretically stop paying. So it just gives you a lot more um, hands-on, I don't want to say control because no one wants to be controlled, but insights into what's going on with the work that you funded. Great. Um, another question, I, I know some of these are jumping around and that's okay as they're being upvoted. Um, what are the best computer tools for developing a therapy? What would be a good starter set of software? Oof, that, that, that's, a, that's a really charged question. I, I don't think there's one answer to that. Um, there's many different approaches out there. There's many different companies, biotechs, academic groups who have uh, different solutions to try and identify therapies based off various algorithms. Um, I, I don't think that there's really one, uh, a one size fits all answer to that. Um, but uh, I, I would just begin researching some, some of the, the options out there, looking at uh, uh, trying to identify what are you trying to do, or are you looking to identify a small molecule uh, to target a specific receptor? Um, if so, what are some of the tools around that? Um, and how can you design a, a molecule to specific to that receptor? But um, yeah, there's, there's, it would really have to begin with looking at what, what's out there in terms of so solution and which one is best applied to uh, your specific problem. 
Great, thank you. Um, another question about gene therapy. So is there any concern or indication that gene therapy will not sustain over time? Um, we don't know yet. So I, I think it holds the promise that uh, it, it, the effect will be really, really long lasting. But if you're thinking about pediatric disease, so you're talking about that you're trying to make the effect last for like 80 years or something like that. And so I just, I mean, nobody can predict, nobody can predict at this time, but um, um, I, compared to other modalities, it's definitely longer. So if you're thinking about intersense oligonucleotides or ESOs, they require frequent re-administration. So about two to three times a year um, over the over uh, life lifelong, so that there's different there's definitely a difference with, with other modalities in terms of how often you would have to administer. That's great. Um, so I know we're hitting um, to the mark of break, but maybe we could go a little bit past um, um, the, the the time um, just to get some of the questions addressed. Um, but you do raise an important point, Ralph, related to you know this question that is still unknown at this time. Um, perhaps what are your thoughts and maybe Yale, James, Donna, and others who may be here um, about polytherapy? So when it comes to genetic-based therapy plus supplementing or complementing that with the different modalities, such as a drug that may improve or been shown to improve quality of life. It's a great um, question, Rodney. I, I think this will change over time as gene therapy develops. And as Ralph said, more will be known on how long it lasts and do you need to redose and can you redose and if you can, do you need to augment with another therapy? Um, sometimes gene therapy will address major organ symptoms and not everything. So you will still need to augment with something that treats the organ that's not affected by or uh, improved by gene therapy. Um, and, and a lot of patients will come into a gene therapy study or a gene therapy therapeutic already being treated with many medications. So you will have to slowly start tapering down things to see what you need to stay on and what you, you can let go of. Um, I think it, as more and more gene therapy products go into the market, we'll know more and more. Um, um, you go. That's that's great. Uh, I think there's some really interesting, intriguing questions here um, in the chat. Uh, this is for Yale and, and also for others, if you want to comment um, about the perception that biotech and pharmas are not interested in finding and investing in therapies for rare disease because they may not be money makers. Populations may be too small. And for something like COVID-19, which impacted the world, and that was given as an example, it's a big money maker for companies. Is this true? Is this sentiment true? What are your thoughts? Can you share some insight in terms of the corporate investing in rare disease? Do they really care? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm the right person to ask or the wrong person to ask, because I work at a company that's focused only on ultra rare genetic diseases. So obviously we care. We are limited with re, by limited resources, there's only so much we can do, but we try to help everyone that we can, either by doing the boot camp or speaking at workshops like this. Um, I think there is a, a set of companies that see the value in rare diseases and understand that many times you learn a lot about specific pathways in the body and about bigger diseases through understanding a rare disease. But not everyone, unfortunately. I used to work at Merck, and I don't think Merck would ever be interested in rare genetic diseases. On the other hand, Pfizer developed a vaccine and has a rare disease unit. So it's it's hard to generalize. I, I would um, like maybe. to add, I think part of the problem is also just the number of rare diseases. So my slide had suggested there's at least 7,000 known rare diseases right now. So it's completely impossible that somebody is working on every single disease at any, at any, at any given time. So how it normally comes to place, it's really once there is a patient group, a vocal patient group, like Donna, for example, explained, I mean, if you reach out to researchers, help them to understand, uh, or, or companies, uh, maybe get some seed funding and so on, 
then it doesn't really matter. Well, it, it, it somewhat will matter how many patients there are. But I mean, then it is less an issue if you have 50 or, or 50,000, 50,000 patients here because it is really to kickstart the research, the research on it. That, that's the most important one. And then for some ultra-rare diseases, you might actually discover once you have a molecular test or a natural history study, there's a lot more patients than you thought. Right. Um, I do want to address one question about cognitive issues or for pediatric patients. Is there a delivery method that would be generally best? For gene therapy? Or mm -hmm. for yeah. general? Right. In general, we'll, just, we'll take that in general, but also gene therapy. You can start with gene therapy. I'll take that one. No, no, no. I mean, it, it is it is the same. It um, it, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter on the age. So there's the same limitations that intravenous can talk most organs except for the brain. If you're trying to get in the brain, it becomes very it becomes very very inefficient. So that's kind of across the board. Of course, I mean, there's special considerations for. Is still a, a very early, very, 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 very young patients. So like very young babies, there are special considerations. They, of course, um, because they're still developing in general. So you have, you have to think about this more carefully as if it's uh, a teenager or even an adult. But that's one of the things that we will ask in a survey. So if your child is very disabled and you can't administer an intranasal therapy, then we will try to make a uh, subcutaneous formulation that the parent can inject the child. If the child can take a drug intranasally, then, and we can formulate it intranasally, then it has an advantage. So we try to understand what the physical limitations are that allow or prohibit from specific mode of administration and develop accordingly. Right, um, and that leads to some of the questions that have been put in the box about surveys and registries. Um, do you think that they've run their course? They take up resources, a lot of them, and especially after a few years, can these resources perhaps be better used elsewhere? From a foundation's perspective or from an industry perspective? Let's start with a foundation's perspective and then an industry perspective. I, uh, I, lo I, think... I love the question and I can't wait for you to answer it. <laughs> uh, because it's... <laughs> It takes a lot of resources from the uh, foundation end to run these registries. And, uh, you know, is it giving us cures? So historically, actually, companies paid for natural history studies, which was great, right? Because it wasn't a burden on the foundations. But what happened then is that one company owned all the information and wouldn't share it with others. So that's what, what does the foundation think about that? That one company has all the data and not sharing it with others and no one, everyone either has to start their own or not have access to information. So the foundations having control over it is amazing. I don't think it needs to be funded by the foundations. Companies that are interested should participate in the cost and then this will give them access to the, to the outcomes. I still think these are important tools especially for clinical trials, uh, and especially for new diseases, new genes that we don't have much background and information on how they progress or not progress. And as I said before, if we want to use them as an arm, a comparator arm in a clinical trial, we need to have this information. But I don't think the foundations should pay for it. it, for it in reality, though, it becomes very circular because just like you were saying that it's easy for companies to get interested in an organization, especially when they're organized and have registries, then it's hard for us to get the registries without the companies that are interested in us. So, yeah, and I think the business model needs to be probably re reconfigured, uh, talking to companies like Citizen or All Stripes or the companies that offer these services now. How can you put in place an arrangement that will allow you to kick it off and then when you have something, pull in more resources? I would like to add, I think foundations are absolutely critical in reaching out to patients, recruiting new patients, identifying new patients, linking up with the physicians. So I think, I know it's a lot of work, but I mean, with a handful of patients doing a natural history study, it really doesn't give you the full picture. 
So I think there can be never, never enough patience because you will always discover something or something you have not seen before. If you have a few hundred pa patients with the same mutation, suddenly a picture starts to emerge what the specific disease symptoms are in that subpopulation. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with, with what's, what, what's been said on, on, on the re registry note. Like, the, it is a never evolving effort. It's never going to be done. It's a never evolving resource for the community to, to know who the patients are and where, where they are. But it does need the, the sustainability needs to be built into the model a little bit better. And whether it's getting sponsored, as, as Yael said, this having, having companies sponsor the, these registries, but just something which is sustainable in the long run. Because yes, it is expensive to, to set up. It is expensive to maintain, especially. So, um, yeah, there, there does need to be thought around building a sustainable long-term registry that's going to continue serving the evolving needs of the community. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.